It's the first Sunday of Advent, which is short for adventure, right? In one sense, it's not too far off. Our journey of faith is an adventure. Philip was not knowing where we were going, life moving from one experience to another. Advent means coming, the coming of Christ into the world and into our hearts, if we let him. We look forward to the story once again. Bring it on. The baby Jesus, Mary and Joseph, the wise men, the shepherds. Once more, mean old King Herod, the innkeeper who says, no room, no room, but there is a stable out back. Of course, Advent wouldn't be complete without John the Baptist. Prepare the way of the Lord. John's doing a new thing out in the desert, not just cleansing their bodies with water in the river, but forgiving their sins and cleansing them on the inside. The way we begin, the way we prepare, is through baptism. And, and why do we baptism, baptize infants and children? Not because they have so much sin, but because we prepare them as we remind ourselves of the cleansing we received for the sins that Christ died for. Advent, coming, be prepared for when Christ comes again. On the one hand, we're ready for the story. Tell me again about the birth of Jesus, a baby in a manger, silent night by candlelight. Okay, we're ready. But what's with this scripture? It's at the end of Jesus' life, not the beginning. And it's all that end time language. No one knows but God about that day or hour. So, we live in the now. And we have, so, have it so much better than those ancient people. Could they think globally, literally? Could they see what was happening on the other side of the world in that same instant? Could they check out the front page or the financial section and the sports page on their electronic devices? We have it so far more advanced. I mean, after all, we, we have electricity and a microwave oven. So why should we care about end time language? It's not happening now anyway. Why does Jesus make a point to talk about Noah? I mean, talk about your Old Testament. But let's take a closer look. The author of Genesis tells us that Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person on earth at that time. What does that say about the people? God talks to Noah sharing God's disappointment with how the living creatures he had created lived in corruption and violence. And God instructs Noah to build an ark because God planned to save Noah and his family from the flood that was about to be sent. And what I find most interesting about this story, Scripture does not say that people scoffed or mocked or made fun of Noah for building the ark. That's something we think happened. Noah's commentator says this about Noah. The people in the days of Noah did not heed the warnings given. They continued to carry along their activities as normal. And they were caught off guard because they were so wrapped up in everyday events of life that they had no concern for the warnings of Noah or the warnings that he had given about the spiritual realities. By contrast, Noah and his family went about with preparations for the future, even though they saw no specific signs of its coming and did not know the time of its arrival until it came. In Matthew, Jesus gives this warning to the people because they were not prepared. Begs that question, are we? We have prepared the sanctuary with the hanging of the green service. We may be preparing 
for the fruit that we're the food that we're planning to bring for next uh, Sunday's meal. We are preparing for Christmas, decorating the house, buying presents, planning meals, checking in the comings and goings of our family. But are we preparing for Jesus? Not the baby, but the Savior. Jesus talks about two working in the field and the two grinding flour being left behind. One will be taken and one will be left, Jesus says about his return. And it kind of makes that worry inside of us. Will I be taken or will I be left? And it conjures up that popular Left Behind series, being chosen or being left behind, getting to go to heaven or staying behind on earth, kind of an either-or possibility. But here's what another learned scholar has to say about that. These two examples do not stress the sharp division caused by the coming of the, of the Son of Man, but rather the unexpectedness of the event. In other words, turn it around. It's not really about who goes and who stays, but about being ready and prepared because we don't know when it will happen. Think of all the things you don't know when they will happen. What things happened in this past year that we didn't have a clue of that were coming. And I don't mean to open up painful places, but what good things happened also that were a surprise. There are lots of videos on YouTube and TV commercials that show servicemen and women coming home to children and pets that show a complete and unexpected surprise. The joy of seeing someone who wasn't expected. The message of Advent, Jesus is coming, be prepared. Verse 42, so you too must keep watch. Get ready, he's saying. And in part, that's why we light the candle of hope. The hope of Jesus' return getting closer. The hope that when he comes, a new heaven and a new earth will come. The hope for a brighter future and better days ahead. And my hope that you will encounter Jesus in a new and life-changing way. To discover or rediscover the importance of your spiritual life and to be prepared as never before. It's Advent. Let's begin the adventure.